Okay, we're in the book of Judges, and uh, we're in chapter 17, and if you'd like to turn there, we're going to read the first 13 verses, or the entire chapter, and so it begins this way, verse 1, and there was a man of Mount Ephraim, whose name was Micah, and he said unto his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest, and spakest of also in mine ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And when he had restored the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord for my hand, from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it unto thee. Yet he, rest he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had an house of gods and made an ephod and teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And there was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he he journeyed, and Micah said unto him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said unto him, Dwell with me, and be unto me a father and a priest, and I will give thee ten shekels of silver by the year, and a suit of apparel, and the victuals. So the Levite went in. And the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was unto him as one of his sons. And Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. Then said Micah, Now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing I have a Levite to my priest. And again, God will indeed bless the reading of his precious word to us today. So that's Judges chapter 17, and we're looking really at the spiritual decline of Israel. And up to now, we've looked at these judges, uh, these 13 judges we've gone through in chapters 3 through 16. And much of the focus has been on the outward condition of the nation in the sense that they were being attacked from outside by the Canaanites, by different groups, the Philistines, the Moabites, and how God raised up deliverers to deliver them. Now, there was an inward reason for these outward attacks. And we're going to focus more in chapter 17 to the end of the book, uh, to chapter 21, on the, the inward condition of the nation. We're going to get to the heart, really, of Israel's failure. Why was there such failure during this time frame? And we're going to divide it into two sections, because I do believe that this kind of appendix to the book divides into two sections. Chapter 17 and 18 looks at the spiritual decline of Israel. And then chapters 19 through 21 look at the moral decline of Israel. We, I think, maybe mentioned last time that we're not following chronologically. Uh, we're not, even though uh, we've been dealing with the tribe of Dan and Samson, and certainly when we get to chapter 18, we're going to be looking at the Danites again, seeking for a place. But actually, uh, we're not following a chronological sequence at all. In fact, uh, we are going back to the very early days of the book of Judges. We'll prove that um, in a moment, but just so we know that it's not a chronological appendix to the book. <clears throat> It really is a very um, fitting, in a sense, conclusion to the book, because it really does give you a window into the state of the nation during this time frame. Uh, we said there's spiritual decline, there's moral decline. Uh, they go hand in hand. 
uh, once a people spiritually decline, uh, usually along with that goes a moral decline. And actually, what we're going to be looking at in these five chapters could be summarized in the words of Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and particularly verse 28. Romans 1, 28, very familiar verses to many of us, but it says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So the God who had revealed himself to them, the God of Israel, they didn't want to retain him in their knowledge. They had better ideas of how things should be done. They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And that's exactly what is happening here. It seems like God gives them over. In fact, in chapter 17 through 21, uh, the only reference to God showing up in this whole equation is given in chapter 20 and verse 18, uh, where it says, the children of Israel arose and went up to the house of God and asked counsel of God and said, which of us shall go up first to the battle against the children of Benjamin? And again, where it's in the context of civil war, where one of the 12 tribes is almost completely wiped out, and they're seeking the guidance of God in that instance. But that's the only reference, actually, to them seeking the Lord at all during this time period. And so certainly we, we can conclude, uh, and no question really, that idolatry, a wrong view of God, leads to immorality. It all begins when people have a wrong view of God. And again, I would suggest to you that even in our day, if we emphasize the love of God and neglect to emphasize as well equally the holiness of God, <laughs> the righteousness of God, the majesty of God, people will have a wrong view. And they'll feel that God is some kind of indulgent being who puts up with them in all their waywardness and all the rest of it. And so a, a wrong view of God, that's why theology is so important, because a right view of God leads to right conduct. A wrong view of God leads to immoral living. And so this is why having a correct view of God is so important. So we said that these events, uh, two events really recorded chapter 17 and 18, and then 19 through 21, take the reader back to the early days of the judges, immediately following the death of Joshua and the elders that outlived him. How do we know those things? Well, we said in chapter 18, it says uh, in verse 1, in those days there was no king in Israel, and those in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in, for unto that day all their inheritance had not fallen to them among the tribes of Israel. And in a sense, we're taken back to chapter 1 of Judges and verse 34, where we read why they were not able to take their inheritance. Chapter 1, verse 34 says, And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down to the valley. And so because of this opposition from the Amorites, it results in the tribe of Dan looking elsewhere for an inheritance. And what they're going to do is they're going to go up north to the north of the country. And so again, we're going to the early days of Judges. How another, perhaps even more evident reason we're in the early days of Judges is in chapter 20 of Judges. And if you look at verse 28, it says, and Phinehas, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? And the Lord said, go up, for tomorrow I will deliver them into thine hand. Now, Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, certainly would not have been uh, 430 years old <laughs> uh, or above, right? So clearly it's taken us back to the early days uh, of the, the period of the judges uh, after the uh, initial failure to inherit the land. And so, and we'll see later about uh, the, the exact dating of all of this. But so we're really in the early days and we have two representative incidents uh, from them to close the account of the book of Judges to give a deeper insight into what was taking place in the people's hearts from the very beginning of this traumatic period of Israel's history. 
And one of the, the kind of dominant ideas in these chapters from 17 uh, all the way to 21 is this repeated idea of in those days, there's no king in Israel. Again, just want you to see this. Look at verse six. In those days of chapter 17, in those days, there's no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Chapter 18, verse one. In those days, there was no king in Israel. In those days, the tribe of the Danites saw an inheritance. And then chapter 19, verse 1, it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite journeying, sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim, and so on and so forth. Chapter 21 and verse 25. So although it mentions this in other places in the book, not with the same frequency as it does in this final section. Verse 25, the closing verse, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And so basically, uh, because there was no king in Israel, what's been emphasized is the lawlessness of the day as a major cause of Israel's problems because there's no king in Israel. Now, again, we need to ask ourselves the question, what is in view here? Because certainly we, we know that the writer... Um, is writing in the early days of uh, the inauguration of the kingdom uh, on the soul. And some suggest that the idea here is um, he's comparing the more settled period when there was a central government and therefore there was stronger leadership, if you like, and there was more of a moral and religious kind of effect and so social chaos was not quite as prevalent. Now, that's that's a, a, a one view. And I think there's, there's some merits to the view in the sense that uh, if we have weak leadership, it definitely affects God's people, whether it's in a local assembly, whether it's in a nation. Uh, if we have weak leadership, it definitely has an impact. And I think we can all agree on that. But I suspect that in the back of the minds of the writer, he's not saying, because you see, Saul <laughs> certainly had central government, but he wasn't exactly a morally wonderful leader, was he? I think that there's something else being said here. And if you look at 1 Samuel 8, 1 Samuel 8, and verse 6 and 7, he says, but the things displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judges, and Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. And so what we could say is that, that the book of Judges shows what happens in a nation when they reject the rule of God over their lives when he ceases to be their king and the resultant anarchy <laughs> is really a direct result of rejecting God as the ultimate authority and as king. And once he is rejected as king, every man does that which is right in his own eyes. In other words, man becomes the ultimate arbiter of what is right and wrong. He does that which is right in his own eyes not in the eyes of the Lord. And such conditions became a breeding ground for all kinds of idolatry and immorality. It's a disaster to reject divine authority because in doing so, man becomes the authority. And man, with all his failures and all the rest of it, it leads to chaos. And of course, from a practical standpoint for ourselves, when we cease to submit to the Lordship of Christ in our daily lives, in our local assembly, when we cease to be governed by Christ the head and we start to follow the whims of men, what men think is right in their own eyes, we are headed for unmitigated disaster. We must make sure that Jesus is both Lord of our lives individually and Christ is seen as the undisputed head of the assembly. And once we cease in that, we're, we're on a downward spiral where it becomes basically what does man want? Every man really 
wants what is right in his own eyes. And because everybody's opinion is different, it results in chaos. So it's a, it's a great disaster to reject divine authority because the result is man becomes the authority. And when he does th that, uh, rejects divine authority, he begins to do that which is right in his own eyes. And because basically the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things, who can know it? The result is desperate wickedness. And it's a great pity uh, for a people who have rejected the word of God and divine authority in favor of human wisdom. And sadly, I think, brethren, we're living in those days where our nations that may have at one time had a re reverence and respect for divine authority. And you read some of the constitutions. I was reading recently the constitution, the preamble to the constitution of the Irish Republic. And it talks about submitting to the lordship of Jesus Christ. It's very clear. It's amazing. And, and yet now it's the whims of men. It's no longer the lordship of Christ, and the result is absolute chaos. And that will be true in all of our society because human authority has replaced divine authority. And re religious confusion is the, the direct result of failure to submit to divine order. I think it's interesting, isn't it, that... Um, when, when we don't submit to divine order, um, it basically, uh, everything boils down to um, confusion because man, so many different opinions. And you see in Christendom today, um, because divine authority has been replaced by expediency, what the people want, there's absolute religious confusion. And it will continue to be so until divine authority is once again owned and accepted. Now, one other thing before we dive into this passage that I think is interesting is how Bethlehem Judah plays a central role in these two incidents. And not just these two incidents, actually there's three, because if you remember the book of Ruth, uh, if you just turn over to Ruth, you'll see that the book of Ruth was during the days when judges ruled. Look at verse one. Now it came to pass in the days that when the judges ruled, this is Ruth one, verse one, there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And so the point is simply this, that these three incidents that we're gonna be looking at, uh, chapter 17 and 18, uh, the story of Micah, uh, Bethlehem Judah is central to that story. When we look at the story of the Levite and his concubine in chapters 19 through 21, Bethlehem Judah once again is center of all of this activity. And then when we go to the book of Ruth, guess where else is the center? Bethlehem Judah. And so let's just prove that. Chapter 17, uh, verse 7 and 8. There was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he sojourned there. And the man departed out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place. And he came to Mount Ephraim in the house of Micah as he journeyed. So he's in Bethlehem, Judah. He leaves it to go to Mount Ephraim. Okay, so here's somebody who leaves Bethlehem, Judah, he leaves the house of bread, and he goes because perhaps he has, is lacking bread. And he goes to Mount Ephraim looking for a place and looking for support. Look at chapter 19 now and verse 1 through 3. It came to pass in those days there was no king in Israel, and there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him to her father's house to Bethlehem Judah and was there four whole months and her husband rose and went after her to speak friendly unto her to bring her again having his servant with him so on and so forth so again here we go here's a man who's in Mount Ephraim now and he leaves Mount Ephraim to go to Bethlehem Judah and then the book of Ruth it begins in Bethlehem Judah and they leave Bethlehem Judah and where do they go they go to the the land of the Moabites. 
And so just interesting how Bethlehem Judah is center stage to all of these three stories. And isn't it amazing that the religious chaos that is connected with Bethlehem Judah of all the places that God decided to raise up a king that would bring some stability to the nation. Where was it from? Well, it was from Bethlehem Judah. And when he would finally send his son into the world, who ultimately will vanquish religious chaos and moral chaos on the planet, where would he be born? In the very place where all this upheaval is based, Bethlehem, Judah. So a place connected with such privilege, David and David's greatest son was sadly the scene of much confusion and anarchy. Now, as we look at this chapter, and I'm going to kind of give an outline of this chapter and chapter 18, and I want to suggest to you that in verses 1 through 6, the, the emphasis is of chapter 17 is on do-it-yourself religion. Remember, everyone's doing that which is right in their own eyes. So basically, Micah and his mother have their own do-it-yourself religion. They're based on their own thinking, what's right in their own eyes. And so they've got their own plan, their own scheme. And then in chapter 7 through 13, I want to suggest to you it's commercial religion. It's a, it's a, a Levite for hire. <laughs> and he's looking for somebody who's going to take him on and fund him. And even though it involves tremendous compromise of everything a Levite should stand for, he, if the money's right, he's there. So commercial religion. If the money's right, it doesn't matter what God's word says. As long as the money's right, we'll do it. And so commercial religion. And then in chapter 18, the whole chapter, we want to talk about armchair religion. And this is the tribe of Dan basically want somebody to do their religious stuff for them and they're willing to pay the price so they can sit back in their armchair and not do what they should be doing themselves. And so you can see how uh, pertinent it is to the day we find ourselves in where we have exactly the same scenario. So now we're ready to dive into chapter 17 and we begin with this man of Mount Ephraim. There was a man of Mount Ephraim. And again, Mount Ephraim itself was a place of great spiritual significance. Uh, it's the place where Joshua was from and also where Joshua was buried. If you look at chapter 24 of Joshua, you'll notice that, that Mount Ephraim is a place of very significant spiritual history. Chapter 24 and verse 30 it says they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Sarah, which is in Mount Ephraim on the north side of the hill of Geash. And then if you also look down in verse 33, it's also where Eliezer, the high priest, was buried. And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in a hill that pertained to Phineas, his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. So Eliezer, the priest, is from there, buried there. His son, um, <clears throat> Phineas, also Mount Ephraim is where he's from. So a spiritual significance there. It's also close to Shiloh, where the tabernacle was located at this time. And that is what makes it so horrendous, this chapter, that Micah and his mother make up their own religion when the true expression of divine revealed truth is very close to them, right? Because Shiloh is close to Mount Ephraim and they uh, would rather come up with their own scheme than go to the place that God has chosen to place his name at that time where the tabernacle was. Ephraim means double fruit. And so it, it's a place that certainly not only is spiritual significant, but a place where God is expecting great fruitfulness because Mount Ephraim, double fruit. And yet we could suggest from this chapter that there was no fruit for God at all in Mount Ephraim at this time in the history of the nation. So it's a historical significant place. It's close to the house of God. And yet it's a place where 
the people did not love God like they should have done. In fact, uh, it's connected with breaking the first tablet of the law, which is to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so we're going to see, in fact, a good parallel for this chapter would be Exodus chapter 20, because we're going to see again and again and again, the commandments of God are being broken because everybody's doing that, which is right in their own eyes and not which God has revealed. So it says that there's a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And of course, uh, Micah is a wonderful name. It means who is like Jehovah. And certainly Micah was anything but like Jehovah. He does not live up to his name in any way, shape, or form. And so in those days, it tells us there was a man of Mount Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee, about which thou cursest and spakest of also in mine ears, behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. And so the first thing we learn about Micah was his character. He was a thief. And not only was he a thief, in the process of stealing, he was dishonoring his mother, for sure, uh, his parents, disobeying the commandments that says we're to honor our father and mother, and also thou shalt not steal, and then also thou shalt not covet, because obviously he coveted the silver because he took it. And so right there, and we said we're going to uh, kind of parallel Exodus 20, so let's just look there and see just already we're only two verses into this chapter and the commandments of God are falling. <laughs> uh, they're not obeying them. Verse 12, honor thy father and thy mother that they, thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Verse 15, thou shalt not steal. Verse 17, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And so all of this is happening. Three commandments broken by this central figure in the story, Micah, in, in just in, in a short space of time, just in two verses. Interesting that the sum of money that he stole was 1,100 shekels of silver. Last time we saw 1,100 shekels of silver was in chapter 16 and verse 5. That was the money that the five lords of the Philistines had offered to Delilah. The lords of the Philistines came up unto her, said to her, entice him and see wherein his great strength lieth and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we'll give thee every one of us 1,100 pieces of silver. So a considerable sum that's been stolen here. And of course, these first few verses, uh, actually six times in the chapter, silver is mentioned, but in these first few verses, it's mentioned five of the six times, uh, twice in verse two, twice in verse three, and once in verse four. So clearly, silver is a very motivating factor in these opening verses. And so covetousness is at the heart of all this. And we're told in Colossians 3, 5, that covetousness, which is idolatry. In other words, I'm looking to something else other than what I have to satisfy my heart. And I'm saying, God, you don't satisfy I have to have this other stuff to make me happy. You are not enough to make me content and joyful. So he does confess that he took the silver. He says the end, to, I took it. And his mother said, blessed be thou, the Lord, God, Lord God, my son. So he, he's willing to confess but it wasn't really genuine repentance. I believe that this confession was born out of fear of his mother's curse. The 1100 shekels of silver that were taken from thee about which thou curses. And I suspect that the curse that his mother placed on the thief was so strong that he was petrified uh, of the consequences. And, and so he admitted he was wrong and immediately when he 
told that he'd stolen it, concerned about his personal welfare, not wanting to fall under his mother's curse, then his mother says, blessed be thou of the Lord, my son. Interesting that this woman reminds us a lot of James chapter 3. James chapter 3 and verse 9. Her tongue, I don't know whether James had this woman in mind when he wrote this verse, but he says, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing, my brethren, these things ought not so to be. And so here's this woman, immediately she's cursing, whoever stole my 1100 shekels of silver, she's put in a tremendous curse. And then when she finds out it's her son, immediately she blesses him. And so out of that same mouth, blessing and cursing. I suspect the curse was issued with such venom uh, that uh, it brought a swift confession from her son out of great fear. And again, could we suggest that another commandment is being broken here? This woman, who we're going to see, is really a, an idolater at heart, it is far from God, and yet she's invoking the name of God in blessing. And again, Exodus 20, verse 7 says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. And so he is an idolatrous woman, and she's invoking the blessing of God. And I suspect she's guilty of yet another commandment being broken. She does not utter one word of rebuke for Micah's actions. She didn't bring it home to his conscience, the serious of, not, of what he had done. There's no lecture. Uh, neither does he ask for forgiveness. He just simply says, I took it. And so when we compare it to Psalm 51 and what true repentance looks like, we see a different story. Let me just read just one verse from Psalm 51, verse 17, a picture of of what true repentance looks like. It says, the sacrifice of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. There's genuine brokenness in genuine repentance. And it's brokenness because, because God has been dishonored, uh, because it's been an offense to God against thee, against thee only have I sinned, David says, again in that psalm. So this woman, uh, she mentions the Lord's name, and she brings this blessing uh, in the name of the Lord. But we might say she's like those in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 5. She has a form of godliness, but denies the power thereof. So notice verse 3, and when he had restored the 1100 shekels of silver to his mother his mother said i had wholly dedicated the silver to the lord for my from my hand for my son to make a graven image and a molten image now therefore i will restore it unto thee once again we've got an example of double speak she dedicates the money to jehovah and in the next breath, she reveals it's to make a graven image and a molten image. Now, <laughs> a, a graven image is one that's sculptured, you know, so it's somebody's taken a tool and, and kind of formed this image, whereas a molten image is one that's a liquid poured into a mold. And there's some suggestion that perhaps uh, the molten image was a base and then the graven image was what you would put on top of it. But either way, it takes us again, doesn't it, to Exodus 20 and verse 4, where it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that's in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. And so here's this woman. On the one hand, she's dedicated it to the Lord. She's going to give this money to Jehovah. And the next breath, she's going to make a graven image, which is an offense and an affront to God, whose name is jealous, that she would make an image like this. So she says she's dedicated the, the silver. And notice uh, she, she says, I had wholly dedicated the silver unto the Lord. It was all 1100 
shekels of silver was dedicated to the Lord. And so you'd think that that's what she meant by what she said. But we notice in verse 4, yet he restored the money unto his mother, and his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the founder, who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of Micah. We're not reminded about Ananias and Sapphira. Do you remember that they said that they had given all, but they only gave some? Well, she's doing the same thing. I wholly dedicated it to the Lord. She's 1,100 shekels of silver. She's going to give it to the Lord. She's going to make this graven image with it, but she gives the founder 200 shekels. So somebody's been shortchanged here somewhere. And isn't it interesting how sometimes we can do things that are completely contrary to the word of God and do it with the idea that we're going to give something to God. It's like going out and buying a lottery ticket and saying, Lord, if I win, I'm going to give it to, to your work. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's just not acceptable, right? It's, a, it's something we shouldn't be involved with. It's paying lip service to God and basically doing our own thing. And that is exactly what this woman is doing. And so she kept back part of the price. And again, perhaps the covetousness that was in the heart of Micah, he learned it at his mother's knees. <laughs> See, she's obviously covetous too, because she's holding on to a huge percentage of that which she said she had given to the Lord. So she gives it to the founder who made thereof a graven image and a molten image, and they were in the house of God. Now, it's interesting how making um, an image, basically man is constantly making God in his own image and likeness. We, we, can, we can either use it by giving it to a, 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 a craftsman to do it, or we can do it in our own imagination. Sometimes you see that you're teaching the word of God and somebody will come to you and say, well, I don't think God should act like that. Or, no, that's not the way God is. So in their minds, they've made their version of who God is that's contradicting actually how he's revealed himself to be. And they're just as guilty of making an image, in, at least in their imagination, of what they think God is and should be like. It's, it's crafted in their image rather than what he has revealed himself to be. And we must submit to the God of revelation. You often hear people say, I don't think a loving God would ever send anybody to hell. Now, what is that? That is idolatry. We have crafted a God based on what we think is right and wrong, not based on divine revelation, okay? So there's an example, a practical example, and you hear it all the time. I don't think God should do this. Oh, I think God loves everybody. Um, and of course, he does. He loves the whole world, but he doesn't accept sin. He hates sin. And so sometimes uh, we have crafted this God in our likeness, in our image, rather than submitting to the divine revelation. Verse 5, it says, And the man Micah had a house of gods and made an ephod and a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became a priest. So the man Micah has a house of gods. Again, Exodus 20, verse 3, thou shalt have no other gods before me. There's only one God. And yet he has a house of gods. And now he's going to add to his collection. As well as being a thief and covetous, he's an idolater as well. So the newly made image was going to be added to his collection of gods. But it says he made an ephod and then a teraphim and consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. Now notice the incredible admixture here. See, an ephod was part of the high priestly garments. Remember, we've talked about it before. It was this 
plate that went along the front, uh, kind of like a, a, a breastplate, uh, waistcoat idea. And so we, we saw it with Gideon. He'd made an ephod. So he, he makes it an ephod. So he's kind of copying uh, the, the biblical revelation. But then the next thing he does, he, as well as making an ephod, he makes a teraphim. Well, a teraphim is a household god. Uh, it, it's what um, in Genesis 31, remember, uh, Laban said, you've stolen my household gods. These, these, in a sense, good luck charms that were in the house, these household gods. And so here's this incredible uh, syncretism. He's on the one hand trying to give respectability to his idolatry by copying something divine, the ephod, and yet at the same time, he's actively involved in doing that which is clearly contrary to the word of God by making these household gods. And we must beware of syncretism, this idea of mixing together that which is divine with that which is clearly contrary to God. And we've mentioned this before, but Roman Catholicism is a classic example of syncretism. You have a mixture of Judaism, paganism, with a thin veneer of Christianity over the top. And the idea is this, that hopefully this thin veneer of Christianity gives respectability to what is clearly a confusion. Uh, it's not based on the revelation of God. And this is exactly what this man is doing. He's not doing things according to the due order. In fact, to add insult to injury, he then goes ahead and consecrates his own son, to be a priest in his house of gods. So Micah, he's got a house of gods. He made an ephod. He tries to put a kind of Christian veneer on it or respectability. Uh, he's got teraphim, uh, these household gods. And now he consecrates one of his sons to become his priest. And so well, everything about this shouts that they're doing that which is right in their own eyes and not that which God has revealed. And there's so much in contemporary Christianity where people are doing what is right in their own eyes and not what God has revealed. And maybe it makes them feel good. Maybe it, they, it, maybe it, it seems to work for a while. It has an expediency to it, but it's still contrary to God's revealed word. And there's a New Testament warning 1 John 5, 21, last words of that first epistle, my little children, keep yourselves from idols. Making a God in your own imagination that you think he should be like rather than submitting to divine revelation. When it comes to how God should be worshipped, base it on your ideas of how God should be worshipped rather than how he's revealed in the word of God. This expediency, it's everywhere, and it's so contrary. And so he tells us in verse 6, kind of a, a summary of it. In those days, there's no king in Israel. In other words, Micah and his mother, the Lord, was not king. He was not the authority in their lives. And as a result of that, every man, Micah and his mother, did that which was right in their own eyes. And so whenever we reject divine authority, we automatically default to doing what is right in our own eyes, which is human expediency. We must submit to the clearly revealed will of God in the word of God. And we, we, we cannot allow our own ideas to creep into the things of god what we think will work what we think is good it's always a disaster so verse 7 it says there was a young man of bethlehem judah of the family of judah who was a levite and he sojourned there now we might ask why is he living in bethlehem judah certainly it was not one of the 48 cities given to the levites to sojourn in Okay, so it, what, he shouldn't have been there in the first place in Bethlehem, Judah, but that's where he is. He's in the wrong place at the wrong time. And Micah, who was far from God, <laughs> he leaves Bethlehem, Judah, and he goes to Mount Ephraim to the house of Micah. And 
Micah thinks, oh, this guy's in the right place at the right time. He's thrilled to see a real Levite come uh, to his area. Now, we wonder, why was this Levite? Now, we're going to learn in chapter 18, his name is Jonathan. We don't get the name here because we're more concerned with what he's doing than who he is. Uh, the writer wants us to see what this guy is doing. And, and what he's doing is looking for a place. Now, perhaps there's a reason behind this. And perhaps the reason is that the people of God in these apostate days were not properly supporting the Levites like they were responsible to do. If you look back at the book of Numbers in chapter 18, Numbers chapter 18, and then we'll look at a verse in Nehemiah. Numbers 18 and verse 21. It says, Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance for their service, which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Verse 24. But the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore, I have said unto them among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. Verse 26. And speak unto the Levites and say to them, when you take of the children of Israel the tithe which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. And so they should have been provided enough to even be able to give a tithe themselves by the people of Israel because of their service in the house of God. And when you look at the book of Nehemiah, you also notice in Nehemiah 13, Nehemiah chapter 13, in verse 10. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled everyone to his field. And so we, we find that there are at times, especially times of apostasy, that God's people do not take their responsibilities properly to support God's work. And so we're not justifying his conduct, but we're saying that perhaps the, the prevailing condition was, a, was what resulted in this man having to leave uh, the place where he should have been supported, should have been active to travel looking for a place. And so we notice, too, that um, it tells us concerning him, he's a young man. So he's still got plenty of time there. Uh, the Levites were to retire at 50. So he's got plenty of good years ahead of him. He's a young man. He's from a privileged tribe. Uh, he's a Levite. He's actually from the tribe of Gershon. He's a Gershonite. And um, <clears throat> so in, in every way, uh, he should have been looked after. Uh, but... Uh, he uh, was clearly not. And so uh, he belongs to a privileged tribe, responsible for the soft furnishings of the tabernacle, had great advantages, but sadly, like everybody else at this time, he seems to be intent on doing that which is right in his own eyes. And so verse 8 says, and the man departed <clears throat> out of the city from Bethlehem, Judah, to sojourn where he could find a place and he came to Mount Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. So he's on the lookout for a place. And you see that in much of Christendom, uh, the, the way the system is organized, that people go to a school, they get their training, and then once they come out, they're looking for a place. And just we're going to see, like Micah, they'll, they'll be content with a place for a while until somebody comes along with a better offer. And then they'll move to another place. And it really, uh, we see something of the whole uh, clerical system here in these verses. And so verse 9, it says, And Micah said to him, Whence comest thou? And he said unto him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I go to sojourn where I may find a place. What should the priest have said to Micah at this point? Should he not have condemned the idolatry 
that he saw in the house of Micah, wasn't a Levite supposed to administer the truth of God like a teaching uh, servant of God? Should he not have pointed out the errors that were going on? But no, no, no mention of this. In fact, it says in verse 10, Micah said to him, dwell with me and be unto me a father and a priest, and I'll give thee 10 shekels of silver by the year and a suit of apparel and thy victuals." So the Levite went in and the Levite was content to dwell with a man. And the young man was unto him as one of his sons. I don't know what it sounds like to you, but when I think of a father and a priest, <laughs> I can't help but think about Roman Catholicism. Yeah, so you call the priest your father, and he's given all this, this honor. And the priest is very content to dwell in a place where he should have been horrified to dwell. It's filled with idolatry. Everything about it is contrary to divine order. And yet the Levite was content to dwell there. And why? because his conscience was appeased by a great salary. Ten shekels of silver by the year, a new suit every year, and all his food and board thrown in as well. And so he's willing to turn a blind eye to all that's wrong, because, hey, money is good at silencing people. And so he responds to this and for material security he's willing to compromise divine truth now again he's not named till ch chapter 18 <coughs> and verse 30 because the concern is what he's doing rather than <clears throat> who he is so micah consecrated the levite the young man became his priest and he was in the house of micah then said Micah, now know I that the Lord will do me good, seeing as I have a Levite to my priest. Clearly, Micah is very spiritually blind. He's convinced he's on the right track because God has brought a priest to his house to oversee his house of idols. And again, how far he is from understanding the true revelation of God. Uh, he's completely spiritually blinded. And again, in days of apostasy, what we find is there's a great deception. You see it in the pastoral epistles, in the last days. Many will depart from the faith, giving heed to doctrines of demons. There's a great deception. Uh, uh, these uh, demonic spirits, and this there's a deception here. And so... He's so excited because he feels like I've got the real thing now. I've got a Levite. God is obligated to bless. And yet everything he's doing is contrary to divine order. And we're going to find that in the end, he's not only going to lose his priest, he's going to lose his gods, and he's going to lose everything. Because he departed from God's clearly revealed will in the word of God, and ended up with nothing. What a man sows, and that will he also reap. May God encourage us in these days where we find ourselves, very similar days to the book of Judges, are we going to stand uncompromisingly for divine revelation, divine truth, and not be tempted to compromise, whether it be for expediency or for money, offer the pressure of people, but are we going to show fidelity to the word of God? May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.